Good early afternoon, dear colleagues. 13th of June, uh, day 110 of the full-scale invasion of Russia into Ukraine. My name is Natalia, and our first guest today is Serhii Bilenki, the chair of the board of the Federation of Metallurgists of Ukraine. Uh, could you tell us, give us an update about the iron and steel industry since the onset of the war? It's quite complex, unfortunately, quite challenging. Two big industrial facilities are now based in Mariupol, which is temporarily occupied. They have been heavily damaged. The, the degree of the damage, unfortunately, is impossible to assess because we don't have access to this territory. Other facilities uh, are working um, uh, not in the full scale. If we compare the figures of the past five years with this year, unfortunately, the figures dropped five times. If we look at the last month, May, for example, so unfortunately, metal products make only the manufacturing of metal products may only 20% of the usual output that we had in the peace times. Uh, the situation with logistics is quite uh, complex. We cannot deliver and ship the products to our counter agents. This industry was export oriented. All our ports are now blocked by the Russian troops. Uh, there is only one possibility left for shipping, so this is by railway. But there is huge competition there with uh, other uh, players of um, other sectors, for example, the grain sector. So the situation is quite dire, but we do have hopes that the situation will get stabilized soon. If these figures are known, how much metal products Ukraine lost since the full-scale invasion of Russian Federation um, of Ukraine? It's hard to make any calculations since the onset of the war, but uh, as I said, uh, so our capacity right now is 20% of the usual capacity. If we are talking about Mariupol, there were um, major two industrial facilities that would uh, provide 40% of all metal products in Ukraine. We know that Russia is trying to expropriate, appropriate and steal metal products and they ship it through Mariupol ports. Can we stop this somehow? It's impossible to stop because uh, Russia is now acting as a pirate country. So they are uh, stealing our products and they are shipping them to the Russian Federation through Mariupol ports. Most likely they will be selling it. Maybe part of it they will use for their internal domestic needs. But this is piracy. I, I cannot find any other words. So this is a violation of all possible international rules and norms. And this will be um, assessed by the courts and uh, the international law. Uh, we are now um, working on making uh, claims to the Russian Federation, legal claims and uh, pressing charges because um, our facilities uh, were severely damaged during the war, plus the piracy. I believe that our losses uh, make $20 million billion. Uh, we have a question. Andriy Shevchenko, Media Center, Ukraine. My question is about the future of your sector. Most likely, this sector will undergo substantial changes. We will probably have uh, new ways of uh, the product export. There will be changes in Ukrainian economy. Do you have any forecast about the changes of this sector and this industry, the geography, the structure of the products, etc.? First of all, we hope that the territories that are temporarily occupied as of today will be deoccupied soon. We all will need to assess the scope of the damage that was caused to our industry, um, our sector and uh, the territories. Only then we will be able to make some conclusions about the future of uh, Ukraine 
iron and steel industry. I don't want to take chances and make any assessments or talk about the prospects. Those industries that are on the government-controlled territories are recuperating. Um, it, it takes time, it takes um, a lot of time, but when the ports are deoccupied, of course, um, this will ease our objectives. If we decide to launch the production of other types of goods and commodities that we did before the war, so we will probably have to um, make some changes into our industry. Most likely, in some long-term prospects, we will build new industrial facilities or we will extend the capabilities of the existing industrial facilities. But I think that um, it's not going to happen with our industry, metallurgy industry. We are all hoping that the territory will soon be deoccupied, that Ukraine will win that war, and we hope that um, Ukrainian armed forces um, will do everything to approximate our victory. You said that uh, Ukrainian metallurgy industry is working at 20% of its um, capacity, and we don't know the real scope of the damage that had been caused uh, to Ukrainian economy and your industry in particular. Um, even uh, if we take into account land lease and the assistance from the EU, how could Ukraine subsidize the damage caused by some alternative methods, for example, import from other countries or processing uh, the um, metallurgy and metal products from other countries uh, or some alternative uh, processes? Are you considering such options at all? You know that um, mining uh, and processing uh, complex is a um, special type of industry, so um, it's very conservative. You cannot change things overnight. There are certain companies, for example, Dnipro Metallurgy Plant, it's 135 years old, modernizing um, uh, such facility uh, will probably be more complicated than building a new facility. Whether we are going to build new industrial facilities, uh, I think that's also a question that uh, remains to answer. Interpipe, so this is a new industrial facility. Uh, it's not full cycle um, complex. So it's a new facility that we are proud of, but I believe that it's not possible um, with our industry. It's more possible for other industries, but not our industry. We will probably have to get adjusted to the realities that we will have after the war. We will probably have to resume the manufacturing and processing processes uh, at the companies that were not that severely damaged. Uh, We'll probably have to rebuild those industries that were totally damaged, and we will have to use our competitive advantages because we have um, iron ore resources in Ukraine, we have energy resources in Ukraine uh, that help this industry work, and I just hope that we also have logistic advantages, uh, so which is, uh, for example, a seaport, uh, um, these are railway tracks uh, that lead to EU. Therefore, we have no other choices and options but to develop what we can develop. We have another question. My question is about Azov Steel Industrial Facility. I believe that the name itself uh, um, arises uh, controversial emotions. Uh, most likely, your heart was bleeding when you saw how this uh, facility was destroyed. But also, it became the symbol of Ukrainian resilience and resistance. What are your emotions when you think and talk about this facility? And what do your employees, your colleagues uh, think when uh, they talk about this facility? 
It's a um, in, it's a very interesting question. Uh, on one side, we feel um, pride and honor that this industrial facility became the symbol of our resistance and resilience. But we can't even imagine the scope of damage caused to this uh, plant. I hope very much that um, soon we will have our Mariupol deoccupied. And this is not only about industrial facilities, it's also about people who lost their lives, who lost their health, who lost their homes. It's very difficult to talk about these things um, today. Two major facilities that were uh, on that territory, they were conserved as far as possible. Everything was done the way so that one day we can resume the work of those facilities. But we have to understand what is the scope of damage that had been caused. And this information, unfortunately, is missing. We have another question. Looking at Ukrainian history in general as a territory that enjoyed its independence, then it was occupied, it was integrated, the, it was torn apart between many countries. 135 years, that's the oldest uh, iron and steel industrial facility in Ukraine, according to you. If, for example, we have a plan, uh, we have investors who want to invest and want to get their profit. And this will be Western countries. This will not be Russia, China. This will be the United States, Great Britain, France, maybe Turkey. Uh, what kind of slogan can you use in order to attract investments into your industry, into your sector? And how can you make it to, to make this investment long term, quality and efficient? Speaking of the slogan, I think that the slogan is uh, already decided. Ukraine is uh, investment uh, is very attractive for investments because it has attractive geographic location, natural resources, developed industry. And I believe that we should not convince Western investors about uh, all the advantages of our country. Issues arise were um, when we talk about uh, environmental legislation, tax legislation, corruption, uh, inefficiency of um, law enforcement, judicial system, etc. These are the components that investors pay attention to when they are making their decision whether to enter the country or not. And uh, unless we meet all the requirements, I think it's too early to talk about investment boom in Ukraine, plus the political uh, risks. Uh, we have a very challenging neighbor, Russian Federation. It, it also does not contribute to attracting investors. But I think that almost nobody doubts that Ukraine is going to win this war. And I believe that uh, a lot of things uh, might change. Ukraine will be a trendy country, a trendsetter, and it will be the country uh, where investors would want to enter despite all psychological and other risks. And it will be uh, a cool thing to invest into Ukraine. Thank you, Serhi. Just a reminder, we ha our guest was Serhi Bilenki, Chair of the Board of Federation of uh, Metallurgists of Ukraine. Our next uh, briefing will be at 11.30.